So we have a round bottom flask with a cork on it, so it's a closed system. And it's a transparent solution inside. You give it a little shake, it turns blue. Pretty magical. What may be even more magical is that if you let it sit, it's no longer blue. Pretty awesome. So let's explain this magic in detail. So on the left we have dextrose. That's something that we're going to need. And dextrose can be drawn, the structure of it, uh, like this. And so we have uh, six carbons that you can count. Uh, you can also look at the ring form of this and it's a simple sugar. It's a monosaccharide. It's a, it's a pretty much a type of carbohydrate and I'm sure you're familiar with carbohydrates. You can have monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides and so on. Di a disaccharide that we're probably all familiar with is sucrose which is table sugar. And so that's when you have glucose and fructose together. But uh, just glucose by itself is uh, a monosaccharide, and all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. That's going to be important for later. And glucose is pretty much the most common of the monosaccharides. And uh, you have um, this D form as opposed to the L form uh, of glucose. We call it dextrose and so D or D-glucose. So that's your first thing. And it's pretty much all covalent bonding here between all these non-metals. You got just hydrogen, uh, oxygen, and carbon. So you just got that sugar. Okay, now the next thing is potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide is right here. And so here you have a metal and a non-metal part here. Uh, this is a polyatomic ion, so it's kind of a little bit covalent here between the oxygen and the hydrogen, right? But the, the metal and the oxygen part, um, that's where you get that ionic bonding coming from. Uh, and so you got the metal, which in potassium has one valence electron. It's going to be transferred over here to the oxygen, the oxygen and that hydrogen, so that OH negative ion, it's called a hydroxide, that's going to be a negatively charged thing because it just gained a negatively charged electron. And because the potassium K lost the electron, it's going to be positive. And the positive ion is called a cation, and in this case this polyatomic anion is um, is your negatively charged ion. And so the positive and negatives attract there. Um, and you can see how it's in a solid form. You can see how both of these are in a solid form, but we actually also have them dissolved in purified water as well. And so we're more interested in the solution form of these, but very similar. And so one other, uh, other thing to recognize is that the OH is associated with a base. And so you have this pH scale, and when you have an acid, uh, it's pretty much a proton donor, so it's donating uh, these H pluses, which are pretty much just protons. And uh, you got on the other side a base, which is the OH negative. And so notice how when we combine acids and bases, we pretty much get H2O, and that's called acid-base neutralization. Um, and so that's pretty interesting. The other thing to know is that water by itself is neutral, which is pretty much at 7. Uh, and then if you have something like your stomach acid, like hydrochloric acid in your stomach, gastric acid, that's going to be uh, down here in the acidic region, and then your basic region up here, uh, the higher pHs, uh, which is what we're dealing with here with the hydroxide. So it's a base, strong base. And then another interesting thing to know is that if you consume this, um, it clearly says that it's toxic if swallowed, right? And it causes severe skin burns and eye damage. We don't want to mess around too much with this. But one thing that I found uh, from researching is that uh, some of your vomit uh, may have a brown color from altered blood. And that's pretty interesting. And, uh, and so we also know that it turns dextrose brown. And so you'll see if you have a solution of, uh, of these two things mixed together for long enough, um, it will turn a brownish color and right here.
okay? And if you leave it long enough, this is from last year, it kind of turns even more of a darker brown. So I kept this from a year ago. And so we definitely get that brownish, yellowish color coming from uh, the potassium hydroxide and the dextrose. So the dextrose being in a basic environment. Uh, and the formula here is KOH. And so that pretty much explains uh, these two ingredients here. And so really, though, the magic is happening once we get to this methylene blue. And so the methylene blue, you see how that is a 1% uh, solution. And so it's, it's not you know pure methylene blue. Um, but we got, uh, clearly, you can see that it is a blue-colored uh, solution right now. And we don't really need a lot of it. But that looks like this. It's, it's pretty complicated looking. Um, and so we have 16 carbons, we have 18 hydrogens, we have one chlorine, we have three nitrogens, and we have one sulfur. You can kind of see how they're arranged down here. And so uh, here's your three nitrogens, one, two, three, and then you can count up the hydrogens for 18, and you got the chlorine, one chlorine, and the sulfur here. We can kind of see some ionic stuff happening here with this, uh, this chlorine uh, ion, which we call chloride, and another name for methylene blue is actually uh, methyl uh, thioninium chloride. <laughs> so this chloride ion is negative, uh, and so you got it there, and then you got that positive there. One thing to know about this is it's a redox indicator, and so what that means is when you have a substance, let's call it A, and it loses an electron to substance B, uh, we remember the phrase Leo the lion says ger. That's one way to remember it, and Leo stands for lose electrons oxidation, and ger stands for gain electrons reduction. And so you have redox, which is pretty much something that's reduced, uh, and then something else is oxidized, and so that's a redox reaction. And because this is a redox indicator, uh, it will indicate if that sort of stuff is happening. So if this A loses its electron, it's becoming oxidized, and because B just gained that electron, it's becoming reduced. And so that's some terminology for you. So solutions of methylene blue are blue in an oxidizing environment. So if that methylene blue right here is in an oxidizing environment, then it will be blue. And it's going to be colorless uh, if you have a reducing environment or a reducing agent at play. And so pretty much what we're going to do is take this bottle here, and we're just going to take... Uh, pretty much this potassium hydroxide, I have uh, 0.8 grams of potassium hydroxide, and I mixed that to a final volume of about 30 milliliters, uh, and so I have a 30 milliliter solution uh, of potassium hydroxide. The amounts aren't like crazy important, but you do have to kind of get the right ratio here for it to work properly. And then you have the dextrose here. I have one gram of the dextrose with 20 milliliters. Uh, final volume solution. All right, and so we're going to pour each of these in very carefully. And so we'll pour the potassium hydroxide in there. And then we will pour the dextrose in there. And so now we have a colorless solution it's a it's a solution of this dextrose in an in a basic environment coming from the potassium hydroxide and so the final step is we want to take one drop now this stuff stains and some people actually I've heard of people playing pranks on uh, their friends and they put some of this stuff in like uh, their drink and then they urinate uh, a blue colored urine and uh, you just want to be careful with that sort of stuff uh, but this stuff is very blue and so we're just going to put one drop and so just one drop in there of that methylene blue and that's it boom one drop that's all you need so it's just kind of like an indicator and so we got the cap on this guy here and you can kind of see 
that you have that blue coloring and I'm just going to kind of turn this upside down and mix it all together a little bit. No, I don't want to shake it too violently though. And then over time this thing will turn colorless if I just let it sit. All right. So we'll just let it sit there. All right. So now we pretty much have a colorless uh, solution in there and one thing that you might realize is that there's a line on the top of blue and that's one of our clues as to what's happening and see if you can try to figure it out before the end of this video another clue is that when we shake it just one little shake there we can start to see it turning blue. We also see some bubbles. So we got another hint. When I do this in my class, I call it blues clues <laughs> as to what's going on. So I'm trying to point out to you some of the most important things. And so just when it sits by itself, it is colorless. And when you shake it, it is blue, right? And there's a line of blue on the top and when you shake it you see some bubbles and so all of that helps you figure out what's going on all right and so if you haven't figured it out this is what's happening basically you're seeing a reversible process basically what's happening is that you have methylene blue and it's colorless when it's reduced and so you pretty much have a colorless methylene blue because the sugar caused it to be colorless. Because remember, the sugar, the dextrose, is a reducing agent. And so you're starting off in this situation with a colorless methylene blue, which is that indicator. But then if I, indi if I introduce some oxygen, which is in the air, so up here we have, remember, in the air we have about 80% nitrogen, and about 20% oxygen. So we definitely have some oxygen gas up here on the top, which you might not have even thought of. But if I take that oxygen that's on the top and I shake it, that oxygen gas is going to mix into here. And oxygen is a oxidizing agent. In other words, um, this methylene blue will then become oxidized. And remember from our little thing we were saying earlier that when we lose electrons, we're becoming oxidized. And so oxygen um, is a very electronegative thing, a, a very electronegative element, and it has a high electronegativity. It really wants electrons. And so it kind of makes sense that the methylene blue would lose its electrons to that oxygen and then it's going to become oxidized and when it's oxidized it's blue and so we'll see that right now right now we're going to mix the oxygen in with it by shaking it and then you can see the oxidized methylene blue all right now the next thing is what happens after that right now down here the sugar is going to town in a base uh, basic environment and so you have dextrose, which is a reducing agent. And so what was just oxidized by the oxygen is now being reduced by the dextrose, which is a monosaccharide. It's a reducing sugar. And so you have that blue methylene blue being uh, reduced. And remember, reduction means that that methylene blue is gaining electrons. So gain electron, it's being reduced. And then that reduced methylene blue is colorless. And so that's really what you're observing. And so one other experiment that we can do to try to convince you that it definitely has something to do with that oxygen is looking a little bit closely um, at this layer that we were talking about before, this blue layer. And so let me take you over to the vacuum chamber. And if we can vacuum out all of the air on the top, then that according to our theory should make that blue line disappear because this blue line represents the surface between the oxygen gas on the top 
uh, which is what we care mainly about. And uh, the reducing sugar on the bottom. And so really it's kind of a battle between the oxygen and the sugar. The sugar is trying to reduce and the oxygen is trying to oxidize. And so right at that surface right there we kind of have an equilibrium uh, between these two things. So it's a reversible process. And they're battling it out. And so let's uh, go over to the vacuum chamber. Alright, so here's the vacuum pump. And this vacuum pump is connected to this vacuum tubing, which is super strong so the walls won't collapse. And it's plugged in with electricity. And this is going to pump the air out of this chamber. And so we have a silicone uh, seal that we custom made. And we have a uh, pressure uh, gauge. And we have uh, this valve here is open right now so it's allowed to take the air that's inside out. Um, this right now is open too so the atmosphere is going to be coming in and so we need to close this and then we will turn that on and this pressure gauge uh, goes down to negative 30 about negative 1 atm so pretty much right now we're experiencing one atmospheric pressure about um, and what happens is this gauge is going to subtract so down to negative 30 inches of mercury which is about uh, what's in this room right now so we are subtracting the air um, out of this and so right now let's get you down here so we can observe what's happening and so you can see that blue line and so we're just gonna watch what happens I'll try to zoom in here a little bit we're gonna watch that blue line and see what happens here we go Notice how I have the top of the bottle off, so I don't want there to be any sort of pressure building up. So right now we're down to minus 20 inches of mercury. And there's also gases dissolved in the actual solution, too, which you're going to start to see them bubbling out. Now we're at almost negative 30, almost at that full vacuum. And so you can still see that blue line. You can kind of see the bubbles in there. And so we're sucking out some of that dissolved gas. And eventually, the water itself will actually start its forced evaporation process. So pretty much it's cooling down. So you're actually, uh, some of that water is actually turning into, I'll turn the pump off. Some of that water is actually turning into a gas, and so you kind of see how that line uh, disappeared. So now all you have to do for the magic trick is take the bottle and say, hey, I'm going to magically turn this blue. And all you got to do is maybe cover it up and then give it a little shake and it magically turns blue and then you can say I'm going to now pull the blue color out of that solution with my mind it's going to be pulled right out of that solution and so this brings me to Arthur C. Clarke's one of his laws was any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic and so next time you see some magic maybe think about science <laughs>